Hey everyone, how's everybody doing today? I'm uh, starting on at my usual time, five minutes late, so I appreciate your patience. <laughs> but uh, today I have uh, really the two awesome guests, and they they've been on the show before, and and uh, they were, you know, they're very gracious to come back and and uh, be with us again. So I really appreciate that. Uh, of course, uh, if you haven't seen the thumbnail yet, it's going to be uh, Robin Wong uh, and Peter Forsgaard, both are Olympus visionaries, <clears throat> and, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> and, you know, uh, professional photographers, and, uh, and what I wanted to do today was really talk about their photography and, and how they approach photography, and, and whether it's their technical side, creative side, and uh, ask them, you know, some questions about some of their recent videos that they've been producing. So uh, let me go ahead and bring them in. Let's see. I'll try and do this <laughs> without distracting everyone too much. Hey, everyone. <coughs> Hi there. Hi there. Hi. Can everybody see and hear Robin and Peter okay? You guys hear us? The audio okay this time? Hopefully there's no echo. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we missed the drum roll. Oh yeah, I could I couldn't hear that at all. I don't know. Maybe there was some. We'll just have to imagine the drum roll then. Oh yes. <laughs> Hi Andreas. Hi. Hi David. How is everybody? Let's see who's here. Wow, we have a lot of people here. That's awesome. I appreciate that. So. Wow, and and as I'm such an amateur, I'm so sorry compared to you guys. <laughs> I put on a nice suit or jacket, but uh, that's all show. Really, I'm just uh, just a guy with a camera, like like our viewers here. And what I want to do was really, uh, like I was saying, is talk about the more creative side or or approaches that you guys take to photography. And I think uh, your two recent videos are really good examples of that. Uh, Peter uh, did one recently on uh, product photography where he was taking a picture of like one of these mugs that had some kind of way a tail on it or something. <laughs> exactly. It's a wing. Uh, a wing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then Robin uh, did a did a, a macro vi uh, video about macro photography. And uh, he didn't really talk too much specifically about the technique uh, or you know, the technical side of it, but really went more into uh, how it helped his photography. So I think you both, both you guys really took different but very similar approaches because ultimately the, the end game was, or the end result was really about improving your photography. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to kind of dive into that a little bit more. And... Uh, you know, because I, I had a few questions and, and some observations. Um, but on, on Peter, your your uh, your product photography video, you know, you made a lot of lot of good points and you took a lot of time making that video. I can tell as, as a creator myself, I can see, you know, the amount of effort that went into that video. Yeah, yeah it was <laughs> quite a lot of work. Right. Yeah. And... Um, but you made a lot of a lot of very important points, I think. In uh, before you take a picture, you ha you have so many things to consider, and I think the end point was that all of the things that you consider and all of the points that you made really can be applied to any type of photography genre, right? Because uh, ultimately, it's about controlling the light. Or seeing yes. the light. Yes, yeah, that's what it is. <clears throat> and uh, and you you also sort of emphasized, you know, the uh, a, li a little bit about the post processing you went into about you know you want to take an image that's relatively you didn't use these words but the impression I got was you take an image that's relatively flat, uh, without too many harsh shadows or harsh highlights. And you take that image with the intent, it seems like, to go into post-processing. Yeah. And if you want to add shadows and things, that's the place to do it. 
for, or for, you know, you can uh, well you know you're not really supposed to add shadows you make them darker because you need to have the shadow in the first place it's really hard to add it later so okay so, you, you so really like, just like capture to to... A, sh a softer shadow and then you can bring it down in post yes if if you want you know, of course that's yeah, that's want. a matter of opinion and, and what what each photographer like but i think it's easier to take the fairly flat image and then you know punch up the colors and the, the desaturation and the contrast later in post to make it as you want it to be okay all right um because a lot of my followers you know i i'm totally in camera guy right or i try to be anyway uh, yeah, but, nothing you know, wrong with that. Nothing wrong yeah, with that. Yeah, and ironically, I went last night looking through my images, uh, and I found that actually a lot. Of, I did post process a lot of images, a lot more than I realized. Um, in <laughs> you know, the, of all the images that I don't share, like online or <clears throat> in Instagram, I did actually post process a lot. Uh, so maybe I'm. Being a little hypocritical, <laughs> I think, with my viewers, because I always, I always stress, you know, get it right in camera, then it's easier uh, to fix and post, and and that's something Robin uh, talked about in his video. But uh, what I wanted to ask you, Peter, was a little bit about. Um, well, let me let me ask Robin about that that philosophy. Do you approach it kind of the same way as 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 Peter with trying to capture the the image with the intent to post process it, or do you always what 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 are your thoughts on that? Uh, depends on what kind of photographs that I'm doing. For commercial jobs, uh, certain shots you know you need to post process it a certain way. Uh, it could be because of the nature of that shoot, or it could be due to requests from the client. Say that I had this uh, couple uh, wedding wedding client, so shooting weddings. Uh, and they specifically wanted the photograph to look a certain way, the vintage look. It was quite in uh, a few years ago. They wanted them to have that filmic, very old, rustic kind of look. So I know that they want that kind of results. So I sort of, uh, I sort of did my photography that way so that I can post-process it to get that results. But uh, for most of my photography that I do for my personal shoots, uh, personal projects, for my macro photography, for my street photography, for my portraits. I generally don't do a lot of post-processing, and I did a post-processing video with Olympus Workspace recently, and you mm -hmm. see that I did very minimal uh, <coughs> processing, just a little bit of adjustment there and here, and that actually means that I actually got my shots to where I wanted them to be, while I was shooting. So I got as close as the final results as I can before I do post-processing. Right, and, and I think that that is the ultimate goal of all photographers because, uh, you know, Peter was saying the same thing about, you know, you don't want to too harsh shadows in your image and then try to bring it up later. Uh, no, that's that's not the way to do it. Right. That's only if, if something went wrong, then then that's a right. kind of like a emergency exactly. thing. If, if, if something went wrong, then you need to do it. But that's not the goal. I right. don't, I don't and, see that's a good way to do it. Yeah, and, and Robin brought up a term in his video that I've, I think I've heard before, but I totally forgot about pixel integrity. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, uh, because, yeah, when you start to push and pull too much, um, yeah, you, the, the pixels start to degrade or don't have that, that, that resolution or, or depth to it that will translate into the final image to give you a nice, clean professional look, so to speak. You know, the colors won't pop as much, the, the blacks won't be completely black, or you won't have that tonality. You lose, I think, yeah, you really lose a lot of the tonality as well. Um, and this is something both of you, and, and Peter went into a little more detail in his video about lighting, uh, but it's something you also talked about in your video, and that's about uh, diffusing the light. And I noticed, like, for your uh, Peter had a big, huge, you know, uh, <laughs> source of light on his on his uh, on his uh, little mug there, and and talked about moving the light further and back. So I was wondering, Peter, if you could explain a little better about the size of the light and the distance of the light on the subject, 
or how that affects the shadows on the subject or, you know, just give a little more detail. Like, is there some ratio you like to see from the size of the light compared to the, 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 the subject or a distance that you use? Yeah, well, uh, it usually I would say that at least four times bigger wow. so that the light is soft enough and as close as possible. So close that, you know, it does just out of outside the frame. Of course, it depends on the everything the scale of everything but right. as close as possible because the closer the light is it is bigger compared to the i don't know the proportion is totally different but it's like sun is huge light source but a straight sunlight is really hard because it's so far away that's why it's actually a very small right. light source that's why when you move the light closer it gets a lot softer because it gets bigger compared to the the subject and then it wraps around and makes a better shape of the object mm -hmm. and then about the contrast then it's you know up to the photographer what what kind of contrast he or she wants to make right and that's that's the main thing and then there's another thing about light which is uh, something that i've always uh, uh, considered to be the right way that every light is on the same no, side of the camera so no cross lighting like the like uh, i don't understand why many places teaches like uh, the portrait photography to do the three-point lighting that you have two lights on the either side mm -hmm. and then you have a backlight and, and that's in my opinion a totally wrong way because then you need to then you have kind of like a cross shadows which is unnatural and the worst thing is that if you have two spots uh, bright spots in the eye which ah. looks totally horrible, horrible okay. to my eye. So if you have all of the lights on the same same side, then you will have natural shadows, mm -hmm. and you will have a nice fall, uh, like like the grad. What have to say? Gradually going from light to the dark. Right, and but then you still have that kicker light in the background, is what you talked about for some rim lighting. Yes. Or yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of than the exception that like every rule should have. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's what you did in your mug video. Is you yeah, I finally, kicker. actually I made two different images because it was kind of dull, the, the production. So I wanted to make a bit more artistic image, the other one. Right. Um, and then Robin, in your, in, your, uh, in your macro video, you know, I saw you use like a diffuser on your flash and you were using off camera flash via, it looked like, you know, just optical trigger. And, uh, you know, obviously that's probably a hundred times the size of your subjects, right? <laughs> In terms of the lighting. Probably too much. Probably yeah. too much. But I, you know, but you're holding it further back away. You know, you can kind of move it back and forth. That sort of yes. mitigates some yes. of that, right? Uh, so tell me about that part of it versus say, I see a lot of macro photographers use like a little ring light on the front of their camera. Or Olympus sells that flash that's like one on each side that goes in front of the lens. Um, you know, why haven't you or do you use any of those kind of things in your in your macro work for lighting your subject? I think uh, there's no right and wrong when it comes to macro photography. And the fun part is you're, you're able to do so much. There's so many ways to approach macro. Uh, and when it comes to lighting, you can be very creative. A lot of people do the DIY diffuser, reflector, softbox kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They do it from uh, they can they can create something for a milk milk bottle, and they can even create something from a shoebox. I did something from a shoebox before, uh, and it's fun. Uh, but when it comes to ring light, uh, I don't like ring light because it's it although it's ring light, but it's shining directly in front of the subject. Uh, rule number one of flash photography, if you want to do, uh, you want to take your flash photography or any kind of lighting to the next level, you don't want your light to shine straight onto your subject. You want it to come slightly above or slightly to the side, slightly directional. That's why I, I don't really like ring light. And um, <laughs> this, this is something that maybe it's personal, uh, maybe some people like it. When you use ring light, that ring light is going to reflect on the eyes of the insect or whatever that you're shooting that has something reflected, right? Mm. And I'm shooting spiders. They have eight eyes. I'm going to see eight rings, which can, I don't know, some people like it, but I find it, it's very distracting. Instead of looking at the eyes of the spider or you know, looking at the details of the fur of the legs, I'm looking at the ring light that's reflected 
from the eyes. <laughs> so yeah. it doesn't really work for me. Um, the twin flash option is actually quite good. Um, the twin flash, but uh, however, if you can diffuse it, I think it can work. And I think it definitely can. You will find some way to diffuse the twin flash because it comes from left and right. But if you don't diffuse it, this comes back to what Peter has just said earlier. When you have light coming from left and right, you're gonna cast a lot of shadows, unnecessary shadows onto your subject, which can actually make things a lot worse. Mm. So what I did is I only deal with one source of light, so it's easy for me to control. Uh, I decide where the light comes from because I'm holding the flash wirelessly, and I control how much uh, light that I want because I control the flash manually, and it is diffused by a large softbox, so I know that the quality of the light is good. I have large source of light, I have good quality softbox. So that's that's the reason why I use the, that, that particular technique. And because it's off camera, I'm holding it, I, I can, let's say that uh, the insect is hiding beneath the leaf. I can move the light below that leaf and still have the light pointing on my subject. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, yeah, when I, when I watch videos or I see images, uh, when I see people using a ring light, yeah, it's really distracting, at least as a photographer, <laughs> you know, when I look at those images. Uh, because, I don't know, and then even as, I guess, if I wasn't a photographer, I'm curious if I would notice that as much, uh, the, the, the ring light in people's eyes or on the subject, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I think if I can say something about the ring light, there is actually... Uh, one teacher here in Finland who is one of the best photography uh, teachers here says that ring light is for those who cannot light subjects. Uh, and and, and, um, wow. and uh, ring light is uh, usually used in, in makeup and and uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then it's kind of like when you have the, the makeup, then the, the, it kind of works there. And if you put it uh, not straight from camera, but if you place it a bit above, then it works and makes a nice little uh, shadow under the nose, what we call mm -hmm. so, so called paramount lighting or butterfly lighting. Then it works, but doesn't work straight from the camera. The only way to use ring light is if you have one of those that has uh, two tubes that you can turn off the other one, so you can leave on the other one that's on the same side as your oh, main light. I didn't know they then made them like that. I don't know if there are any, but if if there are, I think there are some that you can turn on the other side. Then it works because yeah. then you have kind of like the same uh, small direction, and then it's a kind of like a fill light. Then it's all right. I see. Well, I guess some gaffer's tape would do it, right? <laughs> yes, that could do it. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy do it. is in the house. Hi, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy Chang. How are you, everyone? Uh, Jimmy Chang from Red Thirty Five is in the chat section. He's he's also just like Robin, very gracious to come into the chat section and and participate and and hopefully answer some questions too. Um, he's been really good and he you know he has his own channel and he's you know with the uh, lockdown and all he's also uh, live streaming as well. So definitely check those out. I think they're on Wednesdays. I, I don't know, Jimmy. Tell everybody when your streams yeah, are. Oh, are they okay? Um, so thanks for joining. Uh, okay, wow, that was a lot of talk about ring lighting. Because um, <laughs> I, you know, like I said, for me, it's it's it seems like the perfect light, except for the reflections. If you have a shiny object, uh, because it would yeah, diffuse just... the light and give you virtually no shadows, I would think. Uh, but okay. Uh, Let me let me go through my notes real quick because uh, you both said that you use the flashes in manual. So Peter, I think what uh, why why do you use why did you use manual or you know versus say just TTL and let the camera do all the work? I I, I didn't have a flash. I did. I had an LED. Oh, I'm sorry. I had an LED. One, you yeah. had continuous lighting, but you did mention yeah. earlier that you do control flashes manually. Or you tell us what what do you normally do when you do flash photography? Uh, I do uh, very little flash photography nowadays. I use mainly LEDs, continuous light. But if I use is um, Lately, when I've used flash, I've actually used TTL more than manual. I used to do everything manual, but now mm -hmm. I have these Godox Studio flashes, and it works like a charm with manual. Oh. Uh, I mean, with T TTL, I just take the first shot and then just to 
you know, it depends on the, okay. the uh, lightness of the background, how much power I want to do, and plus or minus, and that's it. All right. How, how about it's, you, Robin? It's a, it's a bit different that I used to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've done that time to time uh, with TTL where I just adjust the uh, exposure comp for the flash uh, if I'm shooting TTL. But, uh, I Robin, what do use, you do? I actually use uh, TTL for my events and wedding shoots mm -hmm. uh, because you can't predict the light and the light changes. And I rely a lot, uh, I rely, I don't just use the flash, right? We, we, when we shoot an event or when we shoot a wedding, we try to blend the flash with ambient light so that the photograph comes up more more natural. Yeah. So it's very difficult. Like I'm shooting on the stage, lighting is different. And I'm moving it to the dining table, lighting is different again. And move to the hallway, because we keep moving, right? We're in an event and we, we can't predict and we can't really prepare for the shot. So most of the time I use TTL for that. Uh, but for my macro photography, because I know exactly how far I am from the insect and I know that the setup is pretty much controlled and the camera settings are the same except the only thing that I change on the camera is the aperture because mm -hmm. I want to control the depth of field. Uh, say that if it's a large spider, for example, then I would, or, or a butterfly, which is quite huge, then I'll use maybe f5.6 or f4. But if it's a really, really tiny beetle, like something very small, then I'll use maybe f8 or f11 to, to get sufficient depth of field, and right? we want to see everything in focus. That's when I need to change the flash settings. That's mm -hmm. all, right? The smaller the aperture, I need larger, I mean, more flash power. I just right. adjust the flash. And um, I, there are two reasons why I control flash manual for my flash. Uh, the first one is because I want it to be exactly what I want it to be. Uh, TTL will get you there. TTL will estimate the, the, the flash power. Mm -hmm. it, it is quite, quite good, but I want perfect control of the flash. That's the first reason. Uh, second reason is TTL will fire twice. Right, this is how TTL works. It fires once yeah. for the camera yeah. to calculate how much flash power it needs for the actual shot. So there's pre-flash and actual flash. Uh, sometimes, uh, there are times where there are certain insects that are sensitive to, to the pre-flash. So I, I only have one or two shoe shots. So if I do the, the TTL, it just keeps pre-flashing and it actually annoys the insect. And also because it keeps pre-flashing that it fires twice, it drains the battery faster. And when I'm shooting the insects, I'm generally at a quarter of the power. Sometimes I need to go to half power, but mm -hmm. most of the time I stay about one eight, one tenth of the power of the flash. So when I'm dealing with such high power, it actually drains the battery quite fast. So the second reason is just to preserve the battery life. So yes, most of the time I use TTL for non-macro photography, but for like studio shots, product shots, in controlled environment like macro photography, I actually control the flash manually. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, I was... Uh, I, I kind of have always done control the flash manually. It's just what I've been comfortable with, whether I'm in the field or just for my personal stuff. Uh, but I haven't really done event photography where the light is constantly changing, right? And you're going to miss the shot if you're, you know, your flash power is wrong, right? It might be too bright or not bright enough. So I can see, like, in those situations, TTL kind of makes sense. Um, but for what I do, you know, I'm always on a tripod, you know, an architectural photography, right? I'm on a tripod, and I, I just set the flash power to what I need, and I can take a couple. Anyway, uh, that's interesting. So you do you do both. You don't use TTL for the macro. Um, and I think, uh, Peter, when you were doing your video, uh, you talked about the focal length that you were using, and uh, also you did you did bracketing and not bracketing, like yeah. focus bracketing and not yes. focus bracketing. So yes, if you talk a little bit about the focal length and your aperture that you're using for that kind of shot and how that, you know, kind of applies to, you know, other genres of photography. 
Well, uh, first of all, like I said in the video that the 45 millimeter was because of the perspective, it's more natural to the eye because mm -hmm. if you if you take a uh, shot of a product like that with a uh, wide angle lens, it will be distorted. And if that's not the effect you want, if you want a kind of like a clean, nice image and that represents the uh, shape of the subject, then you need to have a bit longer lens, not too long, but around 45 to 250 to 60 millimeters. Okay, and then, that's, and that's... It's the same. The same thing like in in portraiture also, <clears throat> and and that's that usually. And then you have uh, ideal situation is that you have the the uh, subject as far as uh, from the background as you have from camera. So it's kind of like in the middle from the camera to the oh. background. You should have your subject in the middle. Then you have the let's say the depth of field about right but that's of course it depends if you want more blur or not that's that's always right. a, a case but and then uh, the aperture I usually on images like that if it's a, like a, like a catalog shot I stop down a bit so because I want to have the the depth of field for the whole uh, depth of the uh, subject because that's that's the way you want to do it but then of course if it's an artistic shot then you can do anything you want but okay. uh, but for, for that's why I made those two different images for different purposes so, so that's why and, and, and I did big, uh, the um, focus stacking because I didn't want to stop down too much because of the diffraction which will actually make the image right. look a bit worse but then again if that image is made really small on an online catalog, nobody knows. So in, it was a, like an, a bit overkill for that. But that's just something that I'm, you know, used to do. Yeah. Used to do. Something. Yeah. That's and I think I want. professional pro uh, product photography, from what I've seen, you know, they they do a lot of focus bracketing. You know. Yes. Uh, so my question is, <clears throat> one is when, <clears throat> excuse me, when you say forty-five millimeters, I assume you mean in micro four thirds. Yes. Forty-five. Yes. Uh, but so that would, would be, be about. 90, 90, 85. Yeah. Well, 85 millimeter lenses are usually in full frame. They have these uh, portrait lenses are 85, so it's about uh, yeah, the, it's, the it's in 35. that range. It's, it's about the same. Yeah, okay. it's round from from uh, 80 to 100 millimeters. Are usually is the ideal for portraits right. and also for products. So I, I just want to make that because I, uh, you know, when we talk about 45 millimeters, that's micro four thirds 45 millimeters. Yes. Uh, so anyone watching, you know, just apply that to whatever crop factor you guys have <laughs> on your camera. Yeah. But we all shoot Olympus, right? So it's in moot yes. point. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, you know, on the focus bracketing, let me ask you, Peter. Uh, when you sh your shoot, I noticed you shot like a 2.8 versus 1.2. Yes. Uh, now the 1.2 shot was kind of the beauty shot, right? And yeah. Uh, yes. But when you went to, why did you go to 2.8? Why wouldn't you just stack more photos at 1.2 versus going up it's to 2.8? It's because I want to have the best possible image quality for the shot. And when you stop down a couple of stops, it usually the image okay. quality is better. I but see. yet again, if the image is, you know. Uh, made smaller and put it online catalogs or you post it somewhere nobody knows anyways but that's just something it's a habit that i do yeah yeah it, it makes sense so you're you're, pri you're trying to find the sweet spot of the lens in aperture yes. and that's where you go yeah. Uh, yeah. for focus stacking yeah for, for that for that kind of image where you want to have all the details and everything should right. be sharp because that's that's the way people want to see it on on a catalog shot Okay. Which is which is a different thing from if you do some lifestyle or you do some you know beauty shots or or artistic thing. That's then it's totally a different thing. Okay. Um, and then one other thing you you talked about was, uh, and this is actually going back to the lighting, was uh, blending images together. So, what scenario would you want to blend images? Uh, well, sometimes. Uh, if we take a really shiny object, it's almost impossible to get the uh, object to look natural because there are, you know, some flares, not those flares, but shiny places, and you might have a, a, a spot of light like I had on the mug mm -hmm. from from the from the kick light. Actually, it, it, there was a small spot in the inside the mug which I cloned out and, and 
because it was didn't look good to my eye. And and that's the reason to to blend images, just to take a small part, because if, if it's a curvy subject like this, mm -hmm. you need to have a curvy light too, but most of us don't have those. So we take one image from there, light, then from here and from here, and we blend them together and we get a nice ah. constant uh, light rim light, which would be impossible to do. You cannot do it with the straight light because right, when it, it curves you know, goes like this, you need to have a light from here. And that's that's the reason you, you might want to blend them. And you might have some unwanted reflections, then you might want to okay. have a, play, a, a position that's a bit different, then you can make a composite. Right, right. Okay, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great idea to take two images where the reflections are in different places, basically. And yeah. then... Just, just to make it look natural, like right. there was one light. Nobody would, if if somebody sees that it's been then, then it's no good. You need to have only one light. Even though if you're a photographer and you look at the images, you might guess that it's done that way. But who cares? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I see. But okay, I, I, I do that to some extent. In my architectural photography. I didn't think of it that way for product photography. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. Like what you have if you let's say that you might take the window light if it's really bright you might take it from another shot it's exactly the you know the same idea right right because and I, I do it with uh, hardwood floors and things i'll take one shot yeah uh, exactly the same thing you know where i can okay yeah that's true i, I it's funny like you know sometimes you don't think about or applying yeah. these techniques to other genres of, of photography but you absolutely yeah. can and i think that was the point you were trying to make in your video was yeah. everything you were showing you can really apply to almost everything else um, yeah you could actually the light the, the way i had my lights on that mug you could put a a person in there it would be almost the same thing of course it depends on the uh, the, the face you might want to turn a tweak the lights but the basic idea is exactly the same that you have the the, fill, uh, the main light then you have some fill light or a reflector and then you might have a kick light or or a or what we call here in, in Finnish we say hair light that lights okay. up the hair yeah, we deploy hair light as well oh you thought okay okay good <laughs> yeah I don't know what I call I call it rim lighting but yeah rim lighting yeah, yeah rim know. light is correct. is correct rim light kick light or hair light or whatever I don't need any hair light <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, good, good. So that that that's a uh, that that was one part that you just kind of touched on, but you didn't really explain uh, that part in your video. I didn't know. Yeah, I should have. It was a long video anyway. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe I maybe I do it in another video. Right, right. Yeah, that that would be really helpful to see that kind of in action because there's some post processing involved as well. Yes. Uh, and. It can be hard to wrap your brain around that sometimes exactly what you're doing until you see it. And then you're like, oh, that's easy, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, you know, Robin, you um, you didn't really get into techniques so much. You, you really, when you were talking about lighting and uh, using your flash and your gear, you're really talking about learning to master these techniques, right? Um, because, for example, you could watch a video from Peter and learn that technique uh, of, of uh, you know, blending images or, you know, using four times the size light versus your subject. You learn these techniques, but you talked, you talked a little bit about mastering the technique, and I was wondering kind of what you meant by that exactly. Uh, you know, if you could elaborate sure. on that part of it. I actually did another macro video. I think that was my first few videos that I did. I, it was in July last year, June or July last year. Uh, I already shared all my techniques and my techniques are, they are no secret. Even before the video was made, I've already had an article format right. published on my own blog and on Ming Tian's blog, which right. I contributed to for a while. So my one hand wireless flash with diffuser and one hand camera and lens uh, technique, uh, that, that has been uh, explained many times. Yes. So 
when I did this video, which I uh, published a few days ago, I wanted to share how much I have learned from doing macro photography right. because I picked up macro very early on. And when I did macro, I was I had no choice but to step up my game. I need to care about my shutter speed. I need to care about my depth of field. I need to care about my critical focus because these are the things that will make or break your shot. Even just one mistake, and you know, it's either it's slightly out of focus, you don't get a sharp image, mm -hmm. or your flash execution is bad, and you have a harsh light on your subject. You know, anything can ruin the shot. So why it is so important to master these basics because you have to learn them not just to learn the basics but you have to master them in a way that you can immediately control and get the result that, that, that you want when you're shooting while at the same time you spend most of your energy and effort in trying to get the best composition moment lighting mm -hmm. what's the story that you want to tell you don't want the basics or you know the exposure settings of the camera or right. the auto focus of the camera to interfere with how you want to tell the story through your photograph it should have always been the subject that you're shooting and how to make that photograph impactful rather than oh what shutter speed should i use what focal length should i use mm -hmm. or oh, how how far should i be from the subject or oh, what's the flash power or oh, did the flash ttl work you know did i get it right these are not the things that you have to worry you should have these things at the back of your mind running automatically while you try to get the best out of your photograph so that's what i meant by mastering your basics uh, or the fundamentals of photography okay and then and i guess that that sort of goes in line with you were saying something about shooting discipline. Yes. Um, where you, I, I'm sorry. You, you would say better <laughs> than I would. What, what, what? Sure. Because you, you said you that you'd learned that term or got that term from another photographer. If you could tell me that yes, name again. Yes, Ming Tian. So. Mm -hmm. The other photographer, is, his name is Ming Tian. Uh, he's a Malaysian photographer. I believe he still shoots with Micro Four Thirds. I'm not sure if he still has his PNF, but uh, he, he used Olympus products before, and, and we are friends. I do meet him from time to time. Uh, Ming Tian coined this phrase, shot discipline. He mm -hmm. called it shot discipline. I somehow, I, don't know, I remember it was shooting discipline. So I, when, when I made the video, I, I talk about shooting discipline. And when I checked the, the original article, it was shot discipline. So what he meant by that was trying to get as much, as, as close as you, as, you, as you can to the final result, to, to trying to, mm -hmm. to do the best you can to get the best result that that, that you could possibly get during the shooting process and uh, minimize post-processing. Basically, it means that you have to care about your, your autofocus, uh, how critical is, is, is the accuracy, right? You have, to, you have to care about exposure. You don't see really or, or, or overexpose or underexpose your shots. You have to care about your framing. You, have, you will do minimal cropping at the end of the day. So it's just about being disciplined enough to, to, to care about getting the shots that you want and try not to be sloppy when you're shooting right right and and I think um, really I think that's the the message I got from both videos was about mastering these techniques you know like because when when, when I when you kind of look at it as a whole you know Peter shooting a, a coffee mug you're shooting a spider but the the basic idea of that that discipline and a technique of lighting and getting the shot, you know, as as close as you can in camera so that the post-processing is minimal. Uh, you know, the message is, you know, these are the things that I, I feel like these, these, these are basic things that will make you a competent photographer so that you could go into any genre and, and do a good job. Now you may not be the master of that, right? <laughs> of any particular genre, but uh, that's that's what's allowed me, you know, to kind of diversify a little bit as well. Uh, I, I like the idea that um, uh, in macro photography, it, it forces you to uh, because the tolerances are so small, right? Very tight. You know, you have to have critical focusing. Uh, and uh, the lighting, you have to control the depth of field. Everything is, is very critical. So I, I really like that 
that approach, uh, how that's, you know, because a lot of people, they don't do macro, right? They do close up sometimes, but true macro, like you're doing with the 60 millimeter macro lens, uh, really does, does force you to be very, very critical and have a very high shooting discipline. And, uh, but the lighting is pretty straightforward, right? You just move the flash in and out to adjust the power. Whereas in Peter's video, I think he really went more into the lighting and talked about uh, the techniques for the lighting, like, you know, subject size the, the, to the light, you know, light source and the positioning and things like that. Uh, but that's also sort of a discipline in a way, right? And, and learning these things and then mastering them. Because uh, you, you also talked about like tethering and things like that. So you can kind of get really carried away. But I can see both of these things really uh, applying to any kind of photography. When I really think about the things that I do in architectural photography, um, Peter's video is more applicable to what I do uh, with the lighting and things like that. Uh, but I think um, the macro photography definitely forces it on you, right? Because in architectural photography, I look at depth of field. I need a wide depth of field, so I'm shooting at f/5.6 all the time. Uh, but you can't do that with macro. But in macro photography, it seems like the lighting, you know, was pretty simple, relatively speaking, versus uh, product photography, like a, whether it's a mug or a building. Uh, you know, lighting is very important, right? Uh, so anyhow, um, th those were both excellent, excellent videos. And I, I recommend you guys, when you go back and watch those, even if you've seen them already, and take notes along the way, because you'll really find a lot of good points in the video that can apply to any kind of photography. Because uh, I, I took, I, you know, I took a lot of notes. And this is just an abbreviation, well, <laughs> you know, from those That's videos. Scary. Yeah. Uh, I was really surprised at the depth because, you know, you can when you watch things on YouTube, you can kind of get in the habit of just kind of casually watching them without really thinking too much. Right. It's it's easy to do. But uh, you guys should know that they both really put a lot of work into those videos and, and all their videos. Uh, but these two really focused on photography and the techniques and their approaches and how it's helped them. Uh, become better photographers, and there's a lot of good information there. So definitely check those out again. Uh, and with that said, um, did you guys? Uh, I, I wanted to maybe open up the the questions to our viewers uh, on you know generally in photography, generally related, maybe about those videos. But uh, you guys, um, uh, for for all our viewers there. Uh, you know, Robin and, and Peter have agreed to take some questions. <laughs> uh, so sure. ask away. I, I haven't been following. It looks like Peter may have been answering a couple, but uh, it's good to see everybody here. I see a lot of my regulars. I, I didn't have a chance to come back and say hi to everybody, but I do see you in there, Plato and Rick and, and Hans and and uh, everyone. So uh, yeah, we, we do get some Malaysians as well. Hi, Malaysians. <laughs> uh, okay. I, see, I see some people that I know. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, I'll go ahead and start it off. I think, um, oh, okay. David, David has a good question here, um, about tethering his laptop with Lightroom on his EM1 Mark III. Uh, it, I think you've done that before, haven't you, Peter, with the OMDs? Yes. Yes, you can. The, the, the easiest way, the way I do it is that I use the... Olympus Capture, and then I will uh, transfer the images, you know, while shooting straight to the laptop or or, or the desktop, depends on where I am, and then make uh, Lightroom have a watch folder where the Lightroom actually automatically imports the images to Lightroom catalog, and 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 um, and either you can move them or or just add them where they are. And I think that's the best way. And if you have a, a product shot, you can add a preset to that will make all the the preparations for for a, a actually a ready image.
to be exported if, if nothing needs to be retouched anymore. It's a really fast way of doing. Okay, so do you use the, the Olympus software? What, what's that yeah. called? Uh, Olympus Capture, I think Olympus it was. It? Capture, yeah. okay. Yeah, I think it's when, when, yeah, Olympus Capture it is. And it's a free software, so you can download from Olympus website. Okay. And, and there you can control the camera and then, then and you know, transfer it straight, straight. Yeah, to a folder in your computer and make mm -hmm. that a watch, hold, watch folder for Lightroom, where they automatically, where there is an image to that folder, uh, Lightroom will import it automatically to the okay. database. And that's that's a really good way. All right, and then uh, Craig has a question about the EM1 Mark III's grip. Uh, he he felt like that the the grip was a little bit slicker, not as uh, rubbery as the EM1 Mark II grip. And I I didn't notice it until I actually he actually asked me before. But he wanted to get your thoughts on that. Is that did you guys notice that the grip is a little bit harder or soft or slipperier than the EM1 Mark II? No, but now that I have both cameras here, it actually it is. Yeah, I haven't really used that that so much. I just got this because I have a couple of lectures tomorrow online. For I Olympus. don't have an EM1 Mark III with me, so I can't verify it. But I didn't I didn't notice a difference when I was using it. Right. So. I mean it. Right. It, it's one of those things like I was talking about the other day about, you know, which camera has faster autofocus. It's like mm -hmm. it's very subtle unless you have them side by side. You may not notice yeah. the difference. <laughs> yeah. And then there's also that uh, you might use your cameras different ways. You might take your, uh, you know, different types of shooting. It Like I do, I have when I go out and shoot just, you know, casual shooting, I have my M5 Mark III. And then when I do professional work, I use the M1 uh, Mark II. And, you know, I can't see any difference, but I use them totally differently also. So yeah. they are not like it's the same situation. So I don't really, I can't really say which one is faster. Right. But and then and again, like I would imagine that uh, if you already had the EM1 Mark II, you might have been using the camera for a while. Maybe you have had the camera for one or two years. And after gripping it for a while, I think yeah. it somehow changed the texture of the grip versus yes. the EM1 Mark III, which you have just got and which is totally new. If you're yeah. saying that you have the EM1 Mark III and the Mark II new side by side and there's some difference, then yeah, maybe it might be something suspicious. Okay. Yeah. That, that, well, that's a good point. I mean, I, I know this, my old Maxim film camera, <laughs> the rubber is <laughs> totally destroyed, but, uh, but yeah, age age has something to do with it too, right? The, the camera was probably manufactured three years ago. Uh, but um, and and I I use the EM1 Mark Mark II and Mark III very differently. I don't hand hold them too much. They're usually on a tripod uh, mm. for when I use them. Uh, like the EM1 Mark II is just basically a glorified webcam for me now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sitting on the desk, and then my M1 Mark III. I'm actually using that now professionally in my my architectural. Uh, just a quick word, I guess, uh, about you know what are your, what are your thoughts on the future of Olympus at this point? <laughs> I guess that's kind of an off question, but uh, how are you guys feeling now that it's been almost a year since the the announcement of the demise of Olympus? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I don't see Olympus going anywhere yeah. any, anytime soon. So they've been, you know, producing two cameras and a couple of lenses after that. So uh, I think it's, well, every company is in, in, in danger nowadays, even without the, the virus situation that the camera sales are going down. And I think now, of course, they're going even, even faster because of the virus situation. But, but I don't think Olympus is going anywhere. I think like what Peter said, uh, camera sales are already down even before the virus hits. And now with the impending global crisis, economic crisis, uh, all camera companies will suffer. It's not just Olympus, right? Oh, yes. Uh, it depends on how the company is adjusting and there will be some compromises there and here. But I believe the camera companies will all still be around. I don't think they'll just disappear. Uh, it will be quite some time. Uh, before anything too serious happens. But at the moment, I foresee that Olympus will be around for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, me too. And I, I, I read an article recently, it's on 43rumors.com. There's an interview with an Olympus guy there. 
and he he reiterated that the camera division is very important part of Olympus uh, for their research and development, but not not only that, but also for the brand recognition. Most people know Olympus through their cameras, know the Olympus yes. brand name. Uh, so there's a lot of goodwill built into the camera division, regardless of their sales. Goodwill, which is an intangible number, <laughs> uh, does have a lot of value to the company as well. So I think it'll always be there in one form or another. Uh, they just have to scale to whatever the market demand is, but it, it'll never go away, in my opinion, uh, because of that brand goodwill. Versus somebody like Nikon, that's all they do, right? <laughs> so uh, all their goodwill is built in the brand name, but if they can't, they don't have other things to back up on. If if uh, camera sales go down, that hurts them directly versus for Olympus, it's a small piece of their overall uh, portfolio. Uh, so they can always keep it there. Um, and I guess if you guys, uh, who has, you know, I, I don't have too many videos on using flashes for TTL or manual or ring flashes. Um, do you guys have any specific videos like that on your channels about a flash photography? I don't. I, I, I don't think I have any. The only one that I have is about when the radio system, the seven uh, FL seven hundred. What I wonder what the name. But 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 anyways, the the, the radio flash system was introduced, and I kind of like made a small review on those, but not really. And then I tested the S. Is it FS SFT or SDF? The macro flash. I but think that's about, uh, that's about Matt, it. Matt Tisulanto has some flash videos. Uh, he has videos of, of everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> I guess you should go check out. Uh, I'm sorry, who's blog. Yes, yes. So, who, uh, Matty Tisulanto. Ma yeah, yeah, Matt, yeah, yeah. Matty has oh, videos of everything. True. Yeah, Matty, Matty has a video for everything, okay? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure uh, Red35, if you're still here, you might you might have some references as well. Uh but you know the, the the best thing to do is really just uh, you you buy a TTL compatible flash. You know I like the Godox system with the radio trigger separate, and uh, just practice. I have a couple of videos, or you know I, actually I do have several videos on using flash specifically for that flash system. Uh, but I talk about mostly controlling things off camera and using it manually. I don't have too many in. TTL or talking about TTL. So I think that's something that three or four or five of us can kind of get together and and maybe do a series on that in the in the coming months. Uh, yeah, that, could, that our... could that could be a very good video for in the beginning of May when we do this micro four third YouTubers right. collaboration videos. Flash yeah. could be one actually. Yeah, and you guys are all busted for breaking our secret society out. I was trying to keep it a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. We, we're happy to share with you whatever we, we can. Uh, so that, that I think that'll be a good project for us, though. Yeah, um, why not? That sounds like a good idea. Sounds like there's some sinister plans, secret society. <laughs> I guess, you know, th this has come up uh, a few times a, about the EM5 Mark III. Uh, you know, people are saying that the tripod mount is breaking. Really? Uh, you know, I, I think I, I've I've heard some reports. I haven't heard, but someone, that someone sounds the email, You know, uh, but I did uh, send the emails back to Olympus, mm -hmm. and I mean that's that's the best that myself and Peter can do, right? And although we are Olympus visionaries, uh, we take the feedback and we direct them back to our contacts. Oh yeah. Uh, as far as I know, my EM5 Mark III, if you look at my YouTube channel now, for the past 20 or 25 videos that I did, they were all on EM5 Mark III and they were all on a tripod. So the tripod mount is permanently on my EM5 Mark III. Mm -hmm. uh, I, have, I have no issue so far. So, but so I, you're using I, I a little can't... arc of Swiss plate, like a little one, or do you have a... No, just a normal, normal uh, tripod mount. I don't think it's an arc of Swiss. Okay. Just a normal. Trip. Right. So nothing happened so far. But I've only been using the two lenses that I used on the, on, on the EM5 Mark III were 
45 1.8 and 17 1.8. Yeah, sometimes, tiny sometimes uh, to test certain things, I use the 14, no, the 12 to 45 recently, maybe 12 to 40, but that's it. I've, I've always been using 45 1.8 and 17 1.8. So I don't know what will happen if you use like 40 to 150 F2 Mate Pro frequently or the 300 F4 Pro. So yeah, I can't, can't say anything about that. Okay. Um... You know, I always tell people, you know, just buy, uh, I, I buy the L brackets and then I take the L part off. This one just has the extra grip on it, but this covers the entire bottom with a nice Arca Swiss plate here. Because, uh, you know, the Pen F got kind of similar complaints about the tripod mount being right here next to the uh, lens mount, right? So I avoid the whole problem by using a, a whole base plate. So it adds a little weight to the camera, but if you're on a tripod, what difference, right? Uh, <laughs> does that make? And then hand holding, I always hand hold the EM5 uh, Mark III. I never, but when a, when a base plate comes out available for it, I will get one for it. So, I mean, they're small cameras. You put any kind of leverage or torque on that mount, I don't care if it's a metal camera or a plastic one, you know, you're gonna damage it. Uh, there's the potential for damage, just like the Pen F is all metal, but, uh, you know, any kind of torques or anything can, can break the camera. So just keep that in mind. Uh, anyhow, um, and then as far as the L bracket, they, they have L brackets that, uh, because Lars is asking, is there, a, is there an L bracket that allows you to flip the screen out? There's L brackets that have a little cutout on one side that allow you to bring the screen out. It's, it's not 100%, you know, but it is better than having a full-on L bracket with no cutout on the, on the side. So look, look for one of those, and that'll give you some wiggle room to move the screen in and out from the camera when it's on an L bracket. Um... And I'm sorry. I was just checking the, the uh, streams here. Uh, SL7293 asks, when I look at those uh, insect photographs, it looks like I got the insects to pose. Is there <laughs> any special approach that you, you have to yeah, to, that's a good question, Robin. Yeah, Robin, so, Robin, you missed a word. It, it, it said great pictures. No, no. <laughs> so my, my, answer, my, my answer to that to that question was, well, we Malaysians are friendly, so are our insects. So they are just like us. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I've tried to capture bugs and, and they... They're always walking, you know, some day I was busy, some place to go. <laughs> But you, you do mostly spider pictures. Do they just kind of sit there yeah. most of the time? Yes, yes. The spiders, they just chill. They don't care about you humans. Yeah, They're waiting I, for food. But I was amazed you had some some grasshopper picture or something where it's just kind of oh, yeah. really amazing. How did? But I, I think that goes back to your video when you, you were doing mac, talking about macro photography was, is patience, right? Oh, yes, yes. Patience and uh, you don't always get what you want. You, you do miss a lot, and sometimes you're out for one hour. Maybe you just get one or two good shots, and that's okay. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> and that's it. That's not bad if you can get one good shot every hour. That's, yes, that's yeah. not even bad actually. That's a pretty good. Wow. Good. good. <laughs> I. I. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It. It's. I. I kind of get the same thing with bird photography, right? You have to kind of stand there and see their pattern of movement, uh, you know, how they fly between trees or buildings. And after you stand there a while, you start to see that pattern, like it's the same group of birds that, you know, go from this tree to that tree and then come back, or they all leave together. But if they stay in the area, you, you start to see patterns and it... it and you just have to wait until, okay, there's this one moment when they all like to kind of fly at this spot in the sky and you want to capture that moment. Yeah, uh, bird photography is all about knowing 
how the birds are behaving. That's that's the first <laughs> thing to learn. Then after you learn that, then it's the time to buy the 300 millimeter lens. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah, John True. Mark is making a funny joke about me dropping my cameras on the insects. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> Don't you know? Uh, you know, I dropped I dropped a steak knife on my foot yesterday. I'm lucky I didn't cut my toe off. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness! What are, what are you guys feelings? This this comes up a lot too. What are you guys feelings on third party batteries? Like uh, I would use them. I don't use them, uh, but I used to have third party batteries for my Panasonic cameras. It was a few years ago. I have third-party battery for my LX100. I have third-party batteries for my GM1. But mm -hmm. uh, I, for my Olympus cameras, I always, I never, never had third-party batteries. So yeah, I'm not against them. But right. if you want something cheap and it still works, you can use them. But, but I've always been using original batteries. Yeah. How about you, Peter? Are you pretty much all original all the time? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't use any. I when I had Canons, I had a few that were third parties and they weren't any good. Yeah. But, and then there is also not really sure about the insurance. If you put a a, a third party yeah. battery and something mm -hmm. goes wrong, warranty. I'm not sure if the warranty yeah, might. Warranty. Yeah. yeah right. so there's always a small risk on that. But if something happens with an Olympus battery, then it's a different thing. I have actually had a friend who used, uh, I think it was a EP3. The Olympus EP3, and he had a third-party battery, and the battery was quite new. I think he got it for like a month or two. Mm -hmm. And the battery, while it was inside the camera, got bloated because it expanded, right? And he couldn't take out the battery anymore. So yeah. the battery was permanently stuck in the camera, and he had to send it back to to the, the service center for. Wow. So, so you had, so you kind of like had an internal battery there then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and that's the thing. I mean, I I've I've talked about batteries a lot in my other streams, but uh, I I use a lot of third-party batteries myself. Uh, not because I want the batteries themselves. I I think the chargers that come with them are pretty decent. You know, it's very they they work. Uh, so I look for the charger that I want, like a dual charger or chargers yeah. that show me you know, that work in my car or through USB. So I buy chargers and then for like $5 more, you can get a couple of batteries. <laughs> yeah, so I always have extra batteries, generic, not because I want to want to buy the batteries so much, but because of the chargers, having them, one in my bag, one in my car, one here in the house. Uh, and then, like I said, for five or 10 bucks more, you get an extra battery. But generally I, I have tested the batteries and you know, the, the Olympus batteries say it's rated for 1,200 milliamp hours. You know, the generics are rated for 2,000 milliamp hours. <laughs> but ultimately, you only end up getting about 700 milliamp hours out of the generics. So about 40% less battery life. And they're much more sensitive to heat because the chemistry is very bad. And when you're shooting, you know, particularly if you're shooting continuous high mechanical frame or doing 4K video... The batteries heat up, and that's what causes them to swell in your camera. Yes, uh, is is the heat. So, and you know how the batteries have typically three, four pins on them, like this. Uh, one of those pins is a temperature sensor that will uh, tell your camera if the ba battery is overheating. And the generic batteries, they they put a dummy circuit in there to tell the camera that the battery is always at the optimal temperature, even when it's overheating. And that's the other problem with the generics is they don't have that circuitry. So there's there's a lot of problems with just bad chemistry and uh, the lack of the proper circuitry and the extra pins and, and things like that. I mean, I, you know, I, I could go on for hours about that, but I won't. But generally speaking, you know, uh, Third-party batteries are not a good idea. Uh, and then, speaking of battery, I want to share some something cool. Okay. Um, I was I was using the EM5 Mark II. This was many years ago, and it was my first time doing live composite uh, shooting a Star Trail. 
uh, I was, I think I was with Raja and Raputra. Raja and Raputra is in the chat. Uh, he's a Malaysian photographer. We do shoot a lot. We were out uh, in Kuantan, which is like a, a city away from Kuala Lumpur. And I was shooting live composite, right? But uh, my mistake was I did not I did not have a fully charged battery in the camera. Mm. So I've been shooting you know, the night nice sky Milky Way, doing whole day shooting. So I, the last thing I wanted to do was to do a star trail shot using live composite. So it means that the camera has to be there for like half an hour or 45 minutes or even one hour to get a shot. And halfway through the shooting the star trail, the battery starts blinking red. <laughs> and obviously yeah. because the live composite is still running, I cannot stop it because I know that my, my, my friends, the group of photographers that we're with, we're about to leave in say 15 minutes. And 15 minutes was not sufficient for me to restart another star trail shot. So I just ran with it until the, the battery runs empty. So I wanted to find out what happens if the battery dies in the middle of a live composite. So this is what happened. At the last shot, just before the, 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 the battery dies, the camera stops save the image, finish the composite, got the raw file, then the camera shuts down. Yep. To, me, to me, that's impressive. That was really yeah, impressive. Yeah. Uh, I can <laughs> confirm that because I, I've done the same thing. <laughs> and so I, I don't know. To, to me, to yeah. me, I was quite impressed that Olympus helps you to save that photo yep. before the battery runs out. So yeah, so I didn't have any moment loss. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and and that's the thing with you know when you're when you're not using Olympus Originals, the the generics can die very quickly, you know, with no notice. And with the original batteries, I found they they at least give you some warning, some time, you know, uh, before they they turn off. Uh, okay, so. You know, this is this is another good question. I think about changing lenses when the camera's on your camera. So you're out in the field and you want to switch from a 45 to a 25. You know, do you turn the camera off before you do that, or do you just <laughs> leave it on? What what uh, what what would you recommend? Because this is one of those do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> Actually. Actually, with the newest cameras, you're supposed to have it on because it will, or you can have it on. When you take off, you have the power on, and then you take the lens off. The uh, image, uh, what do you call the, uh, the dust reduction, will work, and then you put it back, and it will stop. So definitely, you can take it off and put it back the lens when it's on the camera. Wow! When the camera is on. Okay. Like for for me, like I generally consciously try to turn off the camera before I change lenses. But I've been in so many situations where I have to rush. I see something is happening, like you know, the bride is moving somewhere. I know something is going to happen. I don't have enough time. Then switch lens. I, I yeah. In in that that kind of moment, turning off the camera was not in the the first thing that you think of. So there, there are many times that I did not turn off the camera. I just switch lenses. So. Yeah, and and I can tell and, you that. If you are, when you're, I think another protection that Olympus has is when you push this button to release the lens, it disengages the pins. Mm. Uh, so that, you know, you don't cause a short circuit. I don't know if that's true for every camera. Like I didn't notice it on this camera, but I've noticed on my other Olympus cameras, when I push that uh, uh, lens release button down, the screen goes blank sometimes. Uh, you know, turning the camera off effectively while you're twisting the lens on and off. But I, you know, I think best practice is always to turn the camera off, <laughs> remove the lens, put the new one on. It slows you down, you know, in the process so that you do it properly and not break the mount or do anything crazy. Uh, but in 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 real life, yeah, I'm always changing it with the camera on. Uh, I'm very guilty of that. Uh, and same, same here. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I, I feel like that. Uh, I've never had a problem. I and I haven't heard of anybody having a problem. But if anybody has, you know, feel free to share. If they've ever, you know, bricked their camera by changing the lens while it's on. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, Craig's asking There's... me. Sorry, let me just answer Craig real quick. Yep. It's I use yep. Sugru, S U G R U. He was asking me about this little rubber thing on my Pen F. My rubber piece fell off, so I used Sugru and I made it a little bigger. Uh, anyway, if you can find it on Amazon. I'm sorry, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, there's Kausta uh, Banerier is, is uh, uh, talking about the the live we had uh, on my channel on Wednesday when I said that the 70 millimeter f 1.2 is the best among the 1.2 lenses, and he, he wants to another confirmation maybe about that. But yeah, that's what I think. It it, it makes the nicest looking image. There's just something about it. It's really okay. hard to explain, but there is just something about yeah, it. Yeah, I was. I, that, yeah, because that it makes it, you know, really, it, it is a, a beautiful image that it makes. It's, and it's a bit different character than the other two lenses. Yeah. Maybe well, it's just me, but that's how I feel. Well, what do you think, Robin? Have you ever used the 17? I, I have, uh, but not very frequently and i do agree that somehow amongst the three lenses uh, uh -huh. 17 is, is the sharpest i've written about this in uh -huh. in my blog review before i feel that it is it is the best among the three but my least favorite though like because i don't use 17 it's nothing to do with the lens mm -hmm. the lens is great it's just not my first choice of focal length i use 45 and 25 more for my photography yeah. But I do admit that in terms of optical quality, like the, the, the image rendering that you get, the 17 is, 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 is interesting. It's quite good. Okay. Let me ask you guys. I, I think Peter's answered this for me before. But, you know, I, I'm trying to take the 75 out a little bit more. But do you, do you guys <laughs> like the 75 millimeter? I love it. Yeah, seventy-five is great. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is. It is, and and if you if someone wants a really really good portrait lens and a small telephoto, and I think that is one of the best choices because it's it's uh, a, a, a lot less money than the the pro versions. But, yeah, and and I do I do wedding photography and I do portrait photography, and that is one of the ways to get that really blurry, dreamy background, right? Yeah, yeah, it yeah, is a beautiful so lens. This is a very important lens for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I took one yesterday of my dog. It's on my Instagram if you guys want to look. I used the 75 on that, and the bokeh is amazing. You know, it's it's a great <laughs> portrait lens, but I I don't do portraits that much. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy, Jimmy's taken off. So goodbye, Jimmy. I'm sorry. Uh, um, thanks for coming oh. in. Uh, so if you're watching this later, I really appreciate you taking the time to come in and, and chat with our viewers here alongside Robin and Peter. Uh, so, so uh, I see a couple of questions, but do you guys see any that you wanted to answer real quick? Um, so Vanna Man asks, uh, why can't I shoot high res when take long exposure with EM5 Mark II? Uh, this is due to the processing limitation of the TruePic 6, 7 process, 6. I can't even remember which processor they use in the EM5 Mark II. Uh, I think the limit was eight seconds. You can go down to the slowest was eight seconds. But that limit has been lifted in the subsequent cameras, like the E1 Mark II, E1 Mark III. You can go way further than eight seconds. So you can do long exposure using high res mode, uh, high res shot using E1 Mark II or E1 X or E1 Mark III. I'm not sure about the Pen F though. I never checked that on the Pen F. Yeah. Okay. But the EM5 Mark II are limited to eight seconds. Limited to eight seconds. Okay, even like, because I seem to remember shooting. Uh, I can't remember which. I think it was the. Pen, I'll have to look, but I did mm. do some high res shots with long exposure. I put like fifteen stops of ND filters on oh. in daylight because I was trying nice. to do long exposure <laughs> infrared. <laughs> oh, nice. All right. I. I Sounds I think fun. it was the Pen F I was using, but I I don't know. But that'll be uh. But that but you answered this question. Eight seconds is the limit on the on the mm. Mark II. Um. Let's see. If I'm. Everybody's commenting on the seventy-five. They like it too. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's just a great lens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah what about Sigma like... lenses? Do you guys ever use any Sigmas? Like, uh, you know, like maybe the Sigma 56 1.4 tempted me once. Have you, uh, have either of you tried I've that? I've actually used it, and I have... I'm quoting Maddie. I have a video about one Sigma lens on my channel. <laughs> oh, okay. I think it was uh, about a year ago. A I think it was the 30 millimeter f1.4, and those lenses are really good. And I've also tried the 56 millimeter f1.4 lens, and, and yeah, I have to admit that you cannot go wrong if you if you choose that lens. Wow. Oh, okay. It's a it's... Good lens. Yeah, those are good lenses. Yeah, I, I've. I... Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, I'm going to answer a question uh, posted by Rick, Rick Bear. Mm. He was asking if, uh, you know, if I were to catch the insect and freeze it or put it somewhere cold, like in the refrigerator, to slow down the insect uh, so that it's easier for me to shoot them. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe in that and I don't encourage people to do that because I think it's borderline torturing the insects, like you're keeping them against so you're taking them out of their natural wherever they are the habitat and you're putting them at home you're freezing them i think that's that's evil like don't <laughs> don't do that right like just respect nature and when i shoot my insects i don't touch them uh, i actually learned this from my uh, there's there's a photographer that i used to follow to shoot insects he told me that you're not supposed to touch the insects we were out in a group and then we saw this, this huge spider on spider web and a fly landed on the web. And one of my friends, uh, she, she's quite quite a, a very nice nice person, right? She, she said, oh no, you know, the spider is gonna eat the fly. We should we should help the fly, you know, you know the fly is, is going to die. And then uh, my friend, Amir, Amir Ridwan, who, who is uh, a mentor to me and everyone else in that group doing macro photography, he said, no, don't touch it. We didn't do anything. The fly landed on the web by himself. So if you free the fly, the spider is going to starve to death. It is not our place to do anything to the insects. Our job is to observe, take the photograph, do as minimal, uh, what, what you call that? You don't interfere, you don't touch anything, take photograph and leave. So to the topic of bringing the insects and freeze them, I, I don't encourage that, I don't agree with that method. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just have to, have to say uh, that. So Pete, uh, Robin has a heart, huh? <laughs> Yeah, that's good. There is some, one question by uh, Brian Parr about uh, the length of the video, because the file size is limited to f uh, four gigabytes. Mm. Uh, you, but the the thing is that it, there is no no uh, what do you call it? Nothing gets lost. It just starts recording the next next file. So we'll you will have diff, uh, different amount of files, and and with the EM1 Mark II, it's when you do uh, the Cine 4K, it's around two minutes, 15 seconds, the clip, and then, then it will record another clip. But there isn't any gap between the clips. Yeah. The, and the 2959 well, is the... Yeah, I the think it buffers it's slightly not, so that you don't drop any frames, I think is no. what yeah, you're trying no, to say. No, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say, yes. There's yeah. no, no frames dropped. Uh, and there's actually one funny thing I said that I've tested the 30 millimeter Sigma. Somebody corrected me. It was the 16 millimeter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I checked. It okay. was 16. Sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> it's a good thing that, that the subscribers know better. That's yeah. Thumbs up for that. Yeah. I uh, now, what about? I guess I think Peter, you've done a video on this about shooting it. Uh, well, you've talked about it certainly today shooting at higher apertures uh, like f16 f22 um, how does how does that affect the sharpness of the image I mean because you get a much bigger depth of field so intuitively you think your images will be sharper yeah it looks sharper but it's not because you have the diffraction mm -hmm. and they say that this diffraction starts somewhere around 5.6 so that that in theory that should be the smallest aperture that can be used but in real life nobody really sees it <laughs> yeah. only for critical work does matter and, and i think hans brings up a good point about you know he sees a lot of us online we have these very expensive cameras at our disposal right uh but you know i 
what what do you think about the other cameras from Olympus, like the EM10 Mark III? How do they compare, say, to uh, the higher end models? What are the key differences, if any? Well, there are two different things: is the uh, weather sealing and the AF speed, and then there are some features that all of us doesn't really need. But what comes to image quality, the difference isn't that big. It all depends on the lenses. So I don't think there is a, you can get really, really good images with, with any any Olympus camera these days. So it, it's not that, it's it's about the weather ceiling and some features and the AF, then that's that's the third thing. Right. How about you, you Robin? Same? I, I agree with Peter actually. Um, the main differentiate differentiation <laughs> between the EM10 series and the EM1 series uh, it's very clear. The EM10 doesn't have weather sealing. The EM1 is weather sealed. The, the EM10 is, is less rugged. The EM1 is built like a tank. And EM1 has like a proper hand holding gripping area, which feels really, really good if you handle yeah. larger lenses. And the best of the best is in the EM1 series. It has better image stabilization, better video capabilities, better EDF. Everything is better, right? Uh, but yeah. it doesn't mean that the EM10 is, is, is not good. Uh, if you're not a professional photographer, you don't need weather sealing, uh, you're not going to use, if you're not shooting sports, right, you don't need that super fast continuous autofocus. And if you're not doing anything serious about video, you're just doing a typical YouTube video, then I think the EM10 Mark III is sufficient for most everyday uh, photographer. Unless uh, if you are like a, a professional photographer and you need the best of the best, then the EM1 is, is definitely for you. Yeah, and, and that's true. And I, I can tell you that uh, I used the M10 Mark II professionally for a little over two years until I broke it. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, and then I switched to the M1 Mark II and Mark III. Uh, and the end res the, the final product that I deliver, there's no difference in the image quality. That's, you know, that you can tell in a blind test. And the M10s have you know, about 90% of the features in terms of like live composition um, and the, a lot of the focus bracketing and the art filters, it has just about everything anyway. Uh, it's only lacking features that only really professionals would care about, you know, the weather sealing, the dual card slots. So uh, you're, not, you're not really missing out on the full Olympus experience at all, in my opinion. Uh, and you'd only consider the higher end cameras for professional work, um, you know, or the grip, the form factor. Maybe that's important. But you can always buy grips for your EM10, which I did. You know, I love, I love my EM10. I, I wish it wasn't so broken. Um, and uh, you know, the quality of the lenses. I think, you know, that that does come up a lot with Olympus. Um, but let me ask you, let me ask you this. I think Lauren, and this is a very common question about, you know, the, the 20 megapixel sensor when, you know, is it, is it, can you see the difference in lower light between that and say the, the M10s? If you're shooting at higher uh, ISOs uh, uh, or in lower light at lower ISOs? I, I haven't really tested them side by side. Mm -hmm. So I can't really say about that for sure. But uh, I've tested some of the newer cameras and there has been a big, not big, but small improvement in the ISO or, or the noise levels. And, and the newer cameras compared to a couple of year old cameras, there's a, about a one stop difference, maybe two thirds of a stop difference. Okay. So the difference isn't really that big that uh, I would be worried about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I might just make a video about that, like comparing. Um, sure. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, uh, that actually could be a good good video. Take the EM10 Mark II yeah. and the yeah. EM1 Mark III and see what the difference is actually. Yeah, I mean, not a bad idea. Yeah, because I, I know idea. you did a noise video about a year or two ago, you know, uh, about reducing noise in your images. Uh, but yeah, I. I don't really see that much difference in practice. You know, you if you get a if you test the cameras in a in a studio environment or or a scientific method, yeah, you can get a little better image quality out of the newer sensor. 
Uh, but in practice, I don't see much difference. Yeah, um, how much does it actually really matter in the in, in the long run? You know, it's, it's there are so many other things that matter in a ph photograph than than the noise or the image quality. Because, of course, in certain point, you you if it's a really bad quality, then it's a different thing. But but all yeah. the new cameras, like all the OMD cameras nowadays. It's not about the camera. It's more about the photographer who uses the cameras. Yeah, and and honestly, even when I compared the noise from my full frame D750 to any of my Olympus cameras, uh, that in in day to day shooting, my street photography and things, I couldn't tell much difference. Because uh, I was I wasn't trying to push the camera's limits you know i'm trying to just take normal pictures <laughs> uh sure when you start pushing things to their limits that's when you start to see some differences and that's where professionals might you know need that kind of flexibility because they're not they can't predict you know particularly event photographers like weddings and events uh that may be a better format but for the average photographer yeah, you know, for all of my professional work, I ditch my D750 because I'm always in control of the light uh, with a f either through flash or just the ambient light that's in the room because I'm on a tripod. So noise has never been an issue at all for the kind of photography and professional work that I do. And, and for most of us, I think, uh, you know, Jimmy Chang and Emily uh, from Micro Four Nerds, you know, they're both wedding photographers and use Micro Four Thirds. Uh, without any issues. Uh, okay, so did did you have did you see any other questions? I can definitely. Uh, Not really. Don't I see anything. Or people are mainly, uh, mainly commenting here. Yeah. You guys, if you guys have any other questions, because I think. Uh, I've been, I've created from the EM one ten to the EM one two. Duo Pro. Oh, I'm not sure what Bob is saying there, but there there has been some questions about like you know the the future future things coming out like the the one fifty to four hundred I think and the Pen F two, uh. And, you know, those kind of questions are, are impossible to answer because uh, other than the rumors that we can all see publicly on these items, you know, there's there's nothing that we can say officially, right? Even yeah, if we exactly. didn't know. Yeah, uh, exactly. So all, all I can do is, is, is you know, and I'm, I'm like, I'm not associated with Olympus in any uh, formal way, you know, other than I have some contacts there, but I'm not a visionary. I have no... Uh, plays with them. We, we should get you to become a visionary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, like I say, the Olympus wants people that, that take good pictures. <laughs> you take good pictures. Oh, my God, please. Not, not I, to I you guys. I think, like, referring to Peter's uh, toilet paper challenge, was, was it toilet paper photography challenge? The hashtag? Yes. Yeah, I think if, if Peter were to pick a winner, it has to be you. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I agree on that. I agree on that. <laughs> and and for all you guys in the chat session, um, please please let us know, right? I think Rob's self portrait of that 007 yeah. theme was it's really amazing. <laughs> oh yeah, it was. It was it was a genius and a stunning image for in, in many <laughs> yeah, guys. In, in many reasons. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I. I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it just came to me, you know, but that's one of those patience things, right? I shot like a stupid roll of toilet paper for a couple hours until that idea finally came to me. Uh. Uh, you know, Steve's asked this question twice now about uh, what's the maximum ISO in live comp? Uh, is, it, is 1600 the maximum? Yes, that's the maximum. Ah, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, do you have any tips on focusing for infrared photography? Do either of you do much I of that? I have never done infrared. Sorry. Well, uh, uh, no, not really. But uh, they used to be in old lenses. They used to be actually a a, a, a kind of like a red line. Yeah. That meant 
that you need to focus on this particular game. But no, I don't. They, the new lenses don't have that anymore. Yeah. It's trial and error. Yeah, if, you, if you're manually focusing, it's hard. What I do is I, I focus... Uh, I focus with the, the filter off, and then I put it back on, and I make sure I have a wide enough depth of field <laughs> where it doesn't have to be spot on, you know? Because the focus supposedly does shift slightly when you put the filter on. Yeah. Uh, but if you're having trouble focusing, just shoot it like f5.6 or f8, lock the focus, and then put the filter on, and don't refocus, and you should be okay. <laughs> <laughs> or you can have the filter on, turn on your live uh, live view boost to num to mode two, so it'll brighten the image up, and then you can try and manually focus that way. But yeah, there's not uh, there's not an easy way to do it. It's one of those things you gotta have patience. Going back to Robin and Peter, you know, and you have to master your your craft and know your gear, and then it with practice, you know, it comes it comes with you. Uh, it gets easier. Oh yes. Um, like they say that your ten ten thousand first images are your worst ones. Oh, how, something <laughs> the first like ten thousand, huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then and then Robin stole my Bruce Lee quote. <laughs> oh, I did. Did I? <laughs> you did. Oh no. <laughs> I know. You guys are always watching my videos and then stealing it later and putting it in yours. <laughs> The, the 10,000 kicks. It was something along the lines of, you know, uh, 10,000 kicks, right? Bruce Lee's not yes, afraid yes. of the man that, that practices 10,000 kicks, but be afraid of the man that practices one kick 10,000 times. Times, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. He's, I, I read a lot of Bruce Lee philosophy and quotes, you know, and he's, he, was, uh, uh, he was an amazing person. Uh, weather ceiling is... Uh, Sorry. Yeah, Lewis, uh, live view boost setting two is is the right one. Uh, is there an advantage of live time over live comp? I use live comp to not have to deal with the noise reduction time. Uh, so live composite versus live time. Who wants that one? Who can take yeah, that? Yeah, different, one? right? The live, live time is basically bulk mode, it means that it allows you to shoot at longer uh, exposure time than 60 seconds. You can go as long as you want. You can go below 60 seconds, you can go more, but it's just basically just one photograph. Uh, the advantage of live time over bulk mode is that you can see the, the image being developed live. It's giving you that, that real time feedback of how the image is. Uh, that's that's basically a lifetime, right? It's just a single capture. The live composite is a completely different thing. So I don't see how they can be compared because live composite is a series of images being composited into one. It is a multiple capture of images and it's the live, actually blends the images together. The only part that adds on from one image to another is if the next image has something brighter. If there is something brighter, say a trail of light, or there's a lightning, or there's fireworks, or something that's brighter than the previous frame, then that brighter region will be blended and additively into that previous frame, while the original exposure stays the same. So they are two fundamentally very, very, very different images. The advantage of using live composite is that you can shoot a one hour image or two hour image and the image will not be overexposed because your exposure remains from the first image, uh, provided that the lighting didn't change. Someone flashed a torchlight onto my image, so that destroyed my live composite image. So. Right. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the purpose of, you know, like Robin explained, the purpose that there's, you know, that they have different purposes, the two different modes. Uh, and you don't use one over the other to avoid the noise reduction time. The noise reduction time is 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 a separate feature, right? Um, to to capture. Well, I mean, I, I think you understand what noise reduction is for. But uh, the the you ha you have limitations with live comp that you don't have in live time. 
you know, live comp, you know, you can set the exposure to a half a second typically. And, but once you set the exposure to higher, you may run back into that, that noise reduction scenario with live composition. Um, it's, it's one of those things you have to kind of practice a lot and you get to know what the camera's doing, but you still have noise reduction in live composition if you go beyond two or three seconds per exposure because uh, it's just stacking multiple exposures for you. Uh, this this is another thing I noticed uh, that Jose is asking about. You know how on the EM10s and, and EM5s, the, all the Mark IIs and below uh, had the panorama assist, right? It didn't create the panos in camera, but it would assist you with putting markers and lines and direction arrows. Uh, I don't see that on the M1 Mark II anymore. Uh, so maybe, am I missing it? Or what would you recommend if somebody wants to do panos with their EM1 Mark II? I have a video about panorama on my channel. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Good. Maddie would be proud. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It's not Maddie this time, it's my channel this time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There uh, are some tips about the. the, the uh, most important thing is to how you rotate your camera. So you don't rotate it like this, but you rotate it like this. Oh. And the the spot here is the so-called nodal point. This is just a ref. I don't know if it's right here, but so that you to rotate it like this. And that's the main thing so that you can have the best possible uh, original for stitching later. If you, if you do this, then it will be a lot harder because the image is taken from a different place. Okay. It can work. It depends on the on the the scenery you're taking, but uh, but that that's the the main thing. And you can do it handheld if you just remember to turn your camera like this, then it's no problem. But having a tripod helps a lot. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know some people they put their thumb right on the lens like this and they rotate it like this if they're doing it handheld. Yeah. That's. Uh. And, you know, but yeah, watch the video for all of the other techniques about doing panos. It's not much different than taking a regular picture, but, you know, you lock your focus on one point. Uh, uh, and manual, frame. manual, out of focus, manual, uh, white balance. Yeah, yeah. So yeah it helps, helps a lot. In, exactly. In, in, so check out Peter's video on that for all of the things that the pano mode in the Mark IIs and below, like the M5 and the M10s, sort of took care of those settings for you, so you'll have to do it manually in the M1 Mark II. You'll have to set those yourself, but they're not hard, you know? Like I said, you mm -hmm. fix the focus point, you fix the white balance, uh, and then you slice it up into thirds. It's it, it becomes very routine if you do panos a lot, and I've done a lot of panos. Uh, I should share those more. Um, and, and this is another kind of a speculation question about, you know, the, the new TruePic 9 processor, uh, any thoughts on adding AI tracking, like on the M1X or in a firmware update or anything like that? No, any news? I think they have to give some different suggestion to the M1X, right? If they put everything in the M1 Mark III, then there is nothing left okay. from the M1X. So I think that was intentional too. Okay, you know. so you think it could handle it, but they intentionally left it out. Yes, yeah. to and, and, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I, I think so too. And and the only possible way is that if uh, the M1X gets something totally new, then they might add it to this this mm. new camera. But not that I know of. So no knowledge, no idea if they do that. Yeah, and and I think in the future, many cameras are going to be differentiated by the features they turn on and off versus the actual hardware in the camera. <laughs> Yes. Mm, uh, true. You know, because we, I, I feel like we've kind of plateaued a little bit technology-wise in, in the hardware side. You know, you can't, how much more can you weather seal a camera or how much, how many more pixels can you put into a camera? You know, those kind of things. How much more stabilization can you get <laughs> over seven and a half stops? Ten you know? stops. <laughs> we've, we've kind of, we've kind of plateaued a little bit until a totally new technology comes out. Uh, so yeah, I I would agree with Robin and Peter that they've limited. It's it's it was a conscious decision to limit it, not a technical decision. Um, 
And uh, Cass, Cass is asking about using, because right now, like, I know there's not third-party softwares are supporting the EM1 Mark III yet. Um, and I, I haven't had any problems. I've imported my EM1 Mark III's into Lightroom, so I don't know why. But I know C1, like Capture One, doesn't support the M1 Mark III yet. So the question is about converting the, the raw mm -hmm. images, the .ORFs, to DNG. Do you have any advantages or disadvantages to that? I'm not really sure, but there should not be any problem when if you convert them to DNG. And then it's I think it's still a raw file, yeah. if, if I have understood correctly, and there shouldn't be any problems. Yeah, I, I know you don't lose any image quality. The raw files converted very faithfully to the DNG format. Uh, you do lose some of the proprietary information built into the, the the Olympus raw files. So if you convert to DNG to work on them, you're not going to suffer image quality wise. You're going to get the exact same dynamic range and range of colors and every you know it's going to be a virtually the same raw file. But save the original ORF file for the other proprietary information that can be in the in that uh, image file, like the wh where was the focus point, or what was the uh, what profile did you use, or what, you know things like that. There's there's a lot of proprietary information in an o, uh, the original ORF file. So eventually, when it does come out, but you can work on DNG files and and get the same results as if you're working on the original raw file. Uh, and I guess Robin, you you said you use what do you use? You use Capture One, right? Yes, that's for my commercial photography. Uh, but for yeah, for my reviews, pure... because every time like the camera comes out, nothing is available. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about like we we get a camera a few weeks before the launch, right? Nothing is available except for Olympus workspace. So we have to use the workspace to open the raw files when we are reviewing the new cameras. Right. Uh, and Peter, you use Lightroom, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm stuck with Lightroom. And when I say <laughs> stuck with it, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's a great software, but uh, there's definitely some other options available. Um, I was going to ask about something, you know, the, uh, with respect to firmware, I guess uh, they have Starry AF now in the M1 Mark III, but it, I guess there's a rumor they're going to put that into the M1X. Have you heard that or has that happened? The Starry no. AF feature? No, 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 I haven't heard anything. Okay, I, I think I've heard something like that, that they are talking about porting the Starry AF into a new firmware for the M1X. Uh, I mean, it seems reasonable to do that because it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they did that. Yeah, but the reverse is not always true. EM1X, like AI tracking down to the M1 Mark III. Uh, and Juan wants to know do you think that uh, going with bigger bigger pixels, like basically having a bigger pixel pitch. So for example, you know, let's create an EM1 Mark V or something, right? Let's say an EM1 6 uh, that has 12 megapixels instead of 20. So you get bigger pixels to gather more light. Do you think there's a market for something like that? I think Panasonic tried. Mm -hmm. um, GH5S. Um, I don't think, I'm not saying that it's not doing well, but I don't think it's selling like hotcakes. So I, I don't I don't think it will do very, very well. There will be someone who wants that, but it will not be like the top of everyone's priority list. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say same. I don't think I wouldn't actually mind. I don't really care about megapixels that much. That mm -hmm. probably would be interesting. But I think the G G H S was more a video camera for low light. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. I it's think it's it was really... marketed for a yeah. very very niche market. You know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I. 
I think 16 megapixels would be kind of my limit in terms of the minimum. Uh, you know, I don't need 24, I don't need 40, but I need at least 16 for the kind of work that mm -hmm. I do. Because uh, I do crop a lot. Uh, the, and maybe it's a problem with my workflow, right? <laughs> but I use a wide 8mm fisheye for my work, and then I crop in what I need a lot of times. Mm -hmm. uh, so going less than 16, it would, it would be a little bit of a problem for me. Um, okay, any, any other question, guys? Did you guys see any? Because... Uh, uh, so, someone, I think it was Paul, Paul uh -huh. asked about selfie assist. Uh, oh, okay. I think the question yeah, I was that. directed to, to Peter. Uh, you had a video about the selfie assist. Uh, so he's, I think he's asking, what, what is it about? Is it the mirrored view of no. the uh, LCD I, I, Actually, I did not have, it was probably when I was uh, talking something something else, it was popped oh. up in the menu, but I've never really used it. But I think it's, uh, it's actually, turning right. the screen somehow that's, oh, so it's, it's yeah, that's yeah. that's what it actually is it's not really something that you r need to take a selfie actually sure and someone sorry i can't remember the name now someone actually asked about the uh, weather ceiling like will it degrade over time do we have to worry about the, the weather ceiling getting worse or the reliability of the weather ceiling of the camera over time uh so how does a camera how how, how do how does weather ceiling work? So it's basically rubber seals, right? Of every opening or any gap, there is a rubber that actually seals the opening to prevent water from going in. And rubber does disintegrate over time. Yes, it does happen. So for you to be really sure that the weather ceiling is still reliable, the only way to truly find that out is to bring the camera to Olympus Service Center and ask them to to see and test whether the weather ceiling is okay or not. That's the only way that you can tell. There's no other way that you can verify whether the weather ceiling is working or not. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they actually, and they are using uh, these high pressure tanks for that, that will mm. mimic the water pressure. Oh. Because of course, obviously they cannot dip it into the water and check it out. So that's why <laughs> they use right. fresh air. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know they had that yeah. kind of service available even. That's interesting, though. Um, this is this is a very technical question, or the, the answer could be very technical. But uh, someone told Craig, an Olympus dealer told Craig that they move from 16 to 20 megapixels, uh, but they don't want to go any higher because uh, it would increase the diffraction on micro four thirds. So. You know, I guess a smaller pixel pitch or higher pixel density, you can see more diffraction. I don't know that it would cause diffraction. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's true. The higher pixel density will cause diffraction to happen sooner. Uh, even like, uh, say, a D800, a uh, Nikon, right, at uh, 36 megapixels, at f5.6, you can actually see the refreshing already. It starts to happen, and it causes a lot of issues, right? So mm. I'm not saying that we shouldn't go higher, uh, but I have no information from Olympus. Olympus didn't tell me any reason why they stay with 20 megapixels or if they were going to go more than 20, 20 megapixels, or I don't think any of us are getting that kind of information. But uh, but what the, the claim, uh, what Craig is saying, that uh, smaller pixels will cause diffraction, that is actually true. That's true. Okay. I mean, it makes sense. It, it the, the higher resolution will see more diffraction. I think, I don't know if it causes it, though. I think it's more, it's just able to see it better. Mm. You know, the, the higher megapixel will pick up, you know, because of the finer resolution, it'll see the diffraction or defects in the lens more so than a lower megapixel camera. But yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm a little curious if if it's cause and effect kind of thing. Um, and and Kostov has asked this a couple times, so I guess we should answer. <laughs> about, oh no! <laughs> you know, an f one point two lens at, at sixty seven or seventy five millimeters. Uh, I mean, I I don't know if any's coming out, but what are your thoughts on a lens like that? 
Well, it could be actually not a bad idea to have a 75 millimeter pro pro version f 1.2 lens. Why not? I don't know how much it would sell though, so that's probably the the problem. Wow. But it would be an interesting lens, though. What I want is a hundred f two macro. Hundred f two macro. Be a yeah, lens. that's true. That yeah, that that wouldn't be a bad <laughs> lens at, at wow. all. Too. Why F2, though? Macro F2? I would think you would want, like, an F22 for macro. I would not use F2 for macro, but that lens can be a really good portrait lens as well. Oh, okay. okay. F2, yeah. So you're talking so about 100 millimeters on a micro four thirds, not like a... Yes. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I want that. Wow. I... I, I've tried putting my 105 millimeter macro Nikon adapt to my Pen F. Nice. Uh, it was interesting. It was interesting. And then I stacked <laughs> some extension tubes on it too. <laughs> but, oh, wow. <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, controlling the, the depth of field was an issue. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, I really think the 75 f1.8 is about as, I guess a 1.275 would be kind of interesting. 100 f2, yeah, I like those. I mean, I God, I, I don't even want to think about what they'd cost, though. Yeah, that's, that's always that's always a, a thing, and that's why it's probably not going to be made because it will it would be too expensive and and and. Robin would be on the one who buy it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, the, I, I still, I'm still tempted since you made that, since we talked about it in your live stream, Peter, about the 17 F one two. I was looking at some today. I found some for under a thousand dollars. Oh, that's not a bad. That's not a bad price. A lot of money though, but not a bad price for the lens. Yeah, I maybe I'll. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, let's not talk about my gas. <laughs> it's rough. Uh, so, what do you what do you guys look? What are you guys thinking about buying next? Let's let's talk about your gas if you have any. What like what would you buy? What are, what are you saving up to buy, Peter, right now? Uh, actually, I'm not saving for anything because of the situation. I, yeah. I need to look look a bit tighter where to spend the money and that, that's that's the fact so okay to be honest, well, if olympus said i'll give you one thing in our inventory what would you take <laughs> oh, what would i take uh, i would probably take the 300 millimeter f4 because i don't have that and i don't want to buy it because i really don't need it but it would be nice to have yeah yeah how about you peter what what would you uh what would you buy if you could have one thing from olympus if they would just give it to you for free you didn't want Mark III. Really? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> but I don't need it for now. I'm still yeah. quite happy with my E1 Mark II, and uh, I have the E5 Mark III. So and I still have the older cameras like the E1, which is still perfectly functional. So I have no, no issues with, with my needs uh, to, to cover my professional jobs at the moment. But uh, yeah, E1 Mark III would be great. Um, but not going to buy anytime soon, though, because you know, of the virus situation and the country about to be collapsed and you know the impending doom is coming maybe yeah. the world will end and crash and burn i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah i think uh well i mean what is it about the em1 mark three though that you'd want over say your em1 mark two i think my em1 mark two has been with me for more than two years now so having another camera to replace it as a main camera would be great then the E1 Mark II will become my secondary camera. So that's that's how it goes. But it doesn't have to be soon. But I don't need it now. Like I said, it can happen half a year from now or one year from now. Okay. So and then there will be a need to get it. So it would just be just uh, just an update Pure, for you. not, not Periodic update, yes. <laughs> yeah, just as a redundancy thing for you, not so much. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I like Peter's choice better. I'd get a 300 f4. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I didn't have the M1 Mark III, I'd, I'd get the 300 f4. But you, you shoot birds, Rob. That's why the, the lens makes sense for you. I, I don't shoot birds. so. Yeah, I would shoot a lot more <laughs> birds if I had that lens. But uh, 
I think uh, Robin did a video on this, but is there a way to tell how many actuations in the Olympus cameras? Yeah. Shutter count. Find the video on my channel. Search shutter count. Shutter count, It's right. a very short, very, very short video. <laughs> yeah. Mike's, Mike's suggesting, uh, Robin, you do a Kickstarter or GoFundMe to get an EM1 Mark III. No, 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 no. <laughs> do that for a better cause, like help a cancer patient or something. No, don't do that for me. Oh, okay. I don't deserve you, you guys can do it for me, though. I got a G9 GoFundMe page, so. <laughs> yeah, no, do, yeah, please please do that for Rob. Seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to see you use a G9 as well. That would be great. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I'm not seeing too many questions come in now, so let me go ahead and... Uh, uh, ask you guys any any final words or project. What, let's start with what do you have coming up uh, next week? What uh, do you have any videos you're working on now that you're going to be posting? Uh, I will be posting a video today, actually. Nice. Good. I made a video about how to stream with the Olympus camera and how to Perfect. what you need for streaming. That's uh, you know people are doing Zoom conferences and yeah yeah and, uh, awesome and Skype. Skype calls and stuff like that. The only problem is that the hardware that you need is is kind of like hard to get <laughs> if you need it now. But but in the future you can get it in a couple of weeks maybe. So yeah, how about, how about... it's been it be it'll be in hour and a half. So it's it'll be online. So not not very long video, but but it's it's a it's a topic. Then I have coming up a video about the. I made a video about the, the, the copying slides a week ago, and there's a follow-up for how to uh, how to uh, uh, what do you call it? edit the negatives, how to get it to be a positive. Oh, okay, there's yeah. Of there's a couple of tricks, and then there is uh, a video coming up about the video settings, and then I will have a kind of like an Easter special, which I'm working nice. on, which is which is I'm not going to say anything about it yet because it's something okay. special. All right, yeah, I'm excited to see your streaming setup and uh... and yes, and then on Wednesday I have a live stream and I have uh, Matt Suez, a that's right. educator from from states, is going to be looking forward uh, to that. Looking forward yeah, that's, that's awesome. he's an interesting he's a he's an interesting guy. He's been photographing since the '90s and he's actually was a photojournalist who uh, was in charge of uh, transferring the magazine or the company from film to digital so there might be some interesting interesting talk, talks about that too so let's see what what he has to say okay yeah i have a lot of film i still have to develop <laughs> or digitize <laughs> so i'm looking forward to the uh your your videos and that live stream how, how about you uh robin what what do you have planned or i have two videos coming this week uh I have a very controversial topic tomorrow. I will not review the topic now. You'll okay. be surprised. But it'll be quite controversial tomorrow. Uh, but the second one is more straightforward. It's about what happens when you over or underexpose your shots. So basically, I purposely underexpose and overexpose my EM5 Mark III's images and then mm -hmm. try to recover the details. So we're exploring that on the next video. Okay. I'm yeah. thinking of. Yeah, I'm thinking of doing another video. Just now, someone someone suggested that uh, we compare the the two image sensors, right? The the previous 16 megapixels versus the newer 20 megapixels. Uh, if I have the time, I might want to squeeze one. If it's not this week, then maybe it'll come out next week. So these are the few that's coming. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be uh, a lot of interest too. Um, what I, if you can, Robin, this will be a request from me. Okay. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. But uh, when you're looking at the, uh, when you're pushing the exposures over and under and then recovering them, if you could show the difference between RAW and JPEG about that recovery ability, uh, and then also the static shot itself, you know, uh, if there's an improvement from 16 megapixels to 20 megapixels in the JPEG image in terms of noise. Oh. Uh, or or not, you know, uh, because there's been some talk about that the processing engine, TruePic 7, TruePic 8, TruePic 9, uh, that they improve the JPEG uh, noise so that you're getting sure. effectively two-thirds of a stop better image processing. Uh, mm. But uh, there's some confusion if they're talking about the raw image or the JPEG. I thought it was the JPEG, but maybe they're talking about the raw image. 
So it'll be interesting to see that. Uh, and then when, when yeah. are you going to start live streaming, Robin? <laughs> Instead of trolling, uh, trolling me, Peter, and Maddie, and, and Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> no, not anytime soon. Not anytime soon. Okay. But I, I'm right. happy to join you. Guys. I'm happy to be here. All right, and then I'll I'll just uh, uh, end it with two quick things here. Uh, uh, you know, we had talked about maybe doing a challenge uh, last month. You know, March first when we did our last collaborative, and I think the challenge really is is been the the toilet paper photography challenge was one of them. <clears throat> uh, and I had talked about doing a art filter or creative type challenge for myself and thinking about that process. So, uh, Walter, I think the uh, Peter's recent video about the uh, taking a picture of that it was a coffee mug with the wing on it and was his challenge and Robin's challenge was the macro photography. <clears throat> and honestly, I haven't done mine yet. So that's uh, that's where we are with that. And uh let's see robin likes controversy i'm sorry <laughs> yeah you've, likes you've had controversy <laughs> yeah you've had some videos about a bit about that Controversial before, stuff. So <laughs> not, not bad actually those are interesting okay um but okay we'll uh we'll wrap it up here and i appreciate you guys coming on again and happy and, to be here uh, you know, and thanks for everyone that came in to watch. I appreciate you guys being here as well, because uh, without you, you know, we wouldn't be here, right? Uh, as they yeah. say. So yeah, without the, without uh, the audience, it would. Be kind yeah, of you guys be safe. All right, during these times, and stay tuned to Robin and Peter's channels. And uh, hope you know, like I said, Peter's going to be on on Wednesday, and I'll be back on uh, Thursday in the live streams. Thanks again for watching, and right. we'll see you guys yeah. later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.